On September 2nd, 1990, at a remote ranch outside Nashville, Tennessee, a group of friends had gathered for a weekend of hunting. Among the group were three paramedics, including David White. Uh, it was a nice fall day. We got there before sunrise that morning and got out in the field. And probably around 9 o'clock, we decided that it was going to be too hot for the doves to fly. So we went up to the house, and they were preparing lunch. Kevin Wilson and Buddy Dixon had taken their ATVs over to visit a friend who lived nearby. When I was coming back, we was racing, and I was winning. One of the paramedics was the district chief of the Nashville Metro Fire Department, Lewis Mason. But we were really watching them because they were flying up there. It was on a gravel road. They were making a lot of dust. So, you know, usually you'd, that's what you'd just be looking at when you're just sitting around, you know, just talking. I noticed that Kevin was cutting across the pasture. Well, y'all come. Moved across the field. I thought that he just flipped over and he was going to get back up. Went back over and see what I could do. We really didn't notice what made him flip. It's so far away. As I got closer, I saw that he was just laying there and wasn't getting up. I looked where the tall grass was, came down to the short grass, and I realized, and I said, no, there's two strands of barbed wire there, and he's hit the barbed wire fence. And that's when I called for them lights first, before I ever got to it. Wrecker service owner Ollie Wright grabbed his walkie-talkie and radioed the Bedford County Communications Center. But it would take 20 minutes before the nearest available ambulance could get to the scene. David got there first and looks up, and I could tell from the look on David's face that there was something bad wrong. Johnny Webb was the third paramedic on the scene. When we got there and seen him, it was, it was about the most devastating wound I've ever seen. It went from ear to ear, and all the way around his neck, and it was open probably about this wide. His voice box was laying on his chest. And he had massive bleeding from both sides of his neck. Honestly, my first thoughts is that we'll sit there and watch him die. You need to see if you can get live flight in route. I don't have the authority. And four, we have three metro paramedics on the scene. Because a district chief happened to be there, he was able to authorize the immediate launch of life flight. They're wanting you to land on the scene. He's going down fast. Okay, Gordon, I'm in deep hurry. Gerald Mountain rode to the barn to get his brother Gordon, who was an operating room nurse. Let me know we had to be resourceful and use what we had. His trachea was severed, and he was actually breathing through the severed trachea right above the top of his sternum. So my main concern was to try to keep the trachea open so that he could breathe through it. Both external jugulars were severed and bleeding profusely. We got a multi-trauma patient down here. It's um, pretty critical going down. As soon as he got to the scene, Gordon Melton began to help treat Kevin, who was his cousin. When I first got out there, I saw Kevin laying on his side. Oh my God, he's going to die. He's bleeding so much. For 15 years that I've worked in an operating room, I've truly never seen an injury of this type on someone who is still alive. Try to hold his head there. Okay. Still there. Okay, don't I can't move my fingers too much. Right. Kevin started to regain consciousness, and I knew he would be shocked by what was happening. Hold on a second. So I started talking to him. I just kept reinforcing. We were trying to help him. He needed to go with us on this. Uh, of course, he couldn't talk. His windpipe had been cut into. He wasn't moving any air through his mouth or nose. 
he was convinced that he was suffocating. We started to lose the radio pulse on him, and blood pressure is really fixing to bottom out. And that's, that's one of the early signs of death. So we had to replace the blood volume. It had to be done quick. We run 4,500 cc's of fluids in him right there in that field. Somebody got a stethoscope? Yeah, let's get a stethoscope. We need some O2. I told him that we would put a tube into his windpipe to help him breathe. I know it's going to choke you. Uh, Kevin. Kevin. Keith, Kevin's brother, arrived in the field. I stayed calm because I just wanted to help him as much as I could. All right, Kevin. Kevin, I'm here. And he grabbed hold of my hand and held onto my hand as I talked to him. Kevin. You got the tube ready. Somebody got a second bag? We ran out of IV fluids pretty quickly. We used up everything they had in the ambulance. When we continue. As we approached Vanderbilt, he lost consciousness. His heart rate started slowing down. He quit breathing by himself. When we heard that Metro paramedics were on the scene, we wondered what they were doing out that far. One of the flight nurses on board was Jane Harry. Though both of Kevin's external jugular veins had been severed, his friends had managed to keep him alive for the nearly 45 minutes it took to get the chopper to the scene. Johnny, what do we have? We ran into the Johnny and David were anxious. Both of them had said, you know, we didn't have anything to work with but our hands. David had more than his arms wrapped around Kevin. He had a lot of heart in there. They didn't want to lose this gentleman. Keep him on his side now. Every time they would put him onto his back to stabilize him, he would lose his airway. Okay, loop that through, please. Keep your IV line through. We only fly with two nurses. We needed another person if this gentleman was going to make it alive. Kevin's cousin Gordon agreed to go. Yeah, I felt like having a finger in the dam here, and I was certain that he didn't have a great deal of blood left in his body. Kevin was still conscious and talking to me. He, at one point, he asked me not to leave him. told him that I was with him for the whole ride here, that we were on our way to the promised land. As we approached Vanderbilt, he lost consciousness. I called in then and told him I needed to go directly to the operating room. We didn't have a lot of time left with Kevin. His heart rate started slowing down. He quit breathing by himself. Kevin was beginning to die. We're ready. I could feel his heart beating between my fingers. If we could just hold on for a few minutes more. And then right he'll come down there. I think it's getting kind of lodged. He's got acid breath sounds on the right at this time. Okay. Do you want to move him on the board? I had a real hard time of letting go of Kevin. So did Gordon. The trauma team at Vanderbilt University Medical Center was led by head and neck specialist Dr. John Coniglia. We started by gaining control of the bleeding sites and then went ahead and tried to reconstruct the tissues. There was a lot of contamination. We tried putting the crushed voice box and the swallowing passageway back together. The operation had just begun when Kevin's parents, Thomas and Doris Wilson, arrived at the hospital. We saw the ambulance go down, and I said, I just hope to God Kevin's not in. Never dreaming that that's where it, it was going to pick him up. I'm not going to lie to you, okay? Kevin's in real bad shape. I'm very honest with my families. They deserve that. 
right. There's a lot of tears because I didn't know if Kevin was going to live. She said, right here is the man that if he lives, saved his life. And she was talking about Gordon. But without Gordon here. I mean, you're not prepared. You think you are, but you're never prepared for something like that. <laughs> By the end of the six and a half hour operation, it was clear that although Kevin's voice box could not be saved, he would survive. Each time after when we went in to see him and all, you could see the improvement in him. And the doctors really couldn't believe how he changed. He, he just seemed to get better. Two months have passed since the accident took away Kevin's ability to speak normally. I'm doing pretty good. There isn't but he's learning to speak again without any mechanical aids. He sees me and sees the voice therapist, and uh, he wants to try the simplest way of voicing words called esophageal speaking, generating your own speech through your esophagus, not through the larynx. At the wound. And I think he'll do well because he's young. And pretty motivated. The scars have healed up real well, Kevin. His will to live and recovery was something I haven't seen in a long while. He kind of fooled everybody. Everybody thought he'd be in the hospital a long time, but he bounced back rapidly. You're doing wonderful. And you're not riding that that ATV, are you? <laughs> That's not what your mom told me, but I'll believe you. Okay. In all rights, Kevin should not have made it, but everything just um, connected. The fact that he had three trained paramedics that happened to be on the scene within actually ran to him in a matter of 30 seconds. I'm not for sure as to what a miracle is, but there was a lot of things going in Kevin's favor that day. Probably the most dangerous motor vehicle we've got is a three-wheel. It's so easy to get hurt even if you're careful on it. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. That's the boy's life. It's truly the type of injury that he would have died just moments afterwards had he been not been able to receive medical attention immediately. I love them all. You talk about miracles and you hear about miracles. The paramedics brought Kevin back to us. They're fabulous. And we thank the Lord for them. And I think that every town should have the money to train, train paramedics. I think you're looking back on it, it kind of reminds you of how close this family is. We don't see each other every day. We know who we are. <laughs>